Last night I had a dream that my fiance cheated on me so naturally I'm going to ignore him all day long until he realises exactly what he did wrong. Wow, crazy. You're crazy girl. Hey there guys, my name's Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for another spooky episode of Killer Weekend where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. Yes, I'm very well aware I have one ear bigger than the other but let's not dwell on that. If you like all things true crime, supernatural, UFO, conspiracy theory, and all that good stuff in between, then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you each week with our true crime killer weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss something spooky I've heard. I will leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. It does involve details of violent crime, the foster care system, sexual abuse, child abuse, and also bestiality. Yup. Not really much I can say about that. Hey my wee gremlins, you may have noticed a slight discoloration on one of my hands. I was using a Kylie Jenner blush tint and safe to say it's left its mark on me. Red finger! Without further ado, let me introduce you to this week's sponsor, HelloFresh. You know me and my love affair with HelloFresh. Not only are they super environmentally friendly, being the very first carbon neutral meal kit company, but they also include pre-portioned ingredients in every meal to cut down on excess food waste. I've been working hard to get bikini and wedding ready, so I'm really appreciative that HelloFresh can deliver their calorie smart options directly to my front door. Yes, my wee gremlins, you too can have the best of both worlds as HelloFresh's pescatarian, veggie and fit and wholesome meal ranges offer twice the flavour than most boring low calorie meals. Are you heading away on a summer vacay this year? Do you worry about where your local supermarket will be and if it's accessible? Family vacations can be stressful enough. Why not alter your delivery address and have HelloFresh delivered right to the front door of your vacation spot with just one click of a button. Are you looking to up your barbecue game this year? Why not wow your neighbours with HelloFresh's cheese stuffed burgers with Pesto aioli. Whatever your summer plans, HelloFresh has a selection that is just right for you. So visit HelloFresh.com and use code MEGAN16 to receive up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. Visit HelloFresh.com and use code MEGAN16 to receive up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. Happy cooking! As some of you may know, I love a good mystery. The ones that are fictional, of course. The ones that happen in real life are the reason why I don't sleep at night and also why I go to bed with a screwdriver under my pillow. But the big difference between the scripted and reality is in real life, sometimes you don't get that clever conclusion. The detective doesn't always save the day and the families don't always get their happy ending. So what do we do when nothing makes sense anymore? We keep digging until we find the evidence that will expose the truth. Tonight, everyone, we will be discussing the mysterious disappearance of William Tyrrell. Little Boy Lost. It was 10.57am on the morning of Friday the 12th of September 2014 when 000, Australia's equivalent of 999 or 911 for you guys in the US, received a frantic call from 48 Benaroon Drive, a child had gone missing. The caller calmly told dispatchers that while she and her family were visiting her mother, her three-year-old son, William Tyrrell, had disappeared in the garden. Like most little kids in 2014, William loved Spider-Man and he'd been playing in his costume all morning long. His foster mother and his foster grandmother enjoyed a cup of tea on the decking while 
whilst William crawled through the grass in the garden and roared like a lion. As the two women relaxed, they heard a big roar and then silence. But this final roar was different. It was almost like a scream, like a warning to a stranger. The area of Kendal, New South Wales in Australia is far from a buzzing city. It's a quiet village filled with affluent neighbourhoods with a small population of 1,000 people. It's a popular habitat for retirees where they can just kick back and enjoy their golden years and that's exactly what William Tyrrell's foster grandmother was doing in 2014. Described as a tough woman with a strict German-born background, she lived for the weekends when her daughter would visit with her family. For legal reasons, because William was a foster child, we can only name certain people in this case. His foster family and his biological family cannot be named. The New South Wales police arrived quickly on the scene and they came to the conclusion that William had just been playing and wandered off into some thick brush and had perhaps gotten lost. But with a lake and a main road nearby, they knew that time was of the essence if they wanted to find young William safe and well. Even though police felt like there was nothing sinister about William's disappearance, his foster family had different ideas from the start, with his foster mother being adamant that someone had taken her son. Dozens of people arrived at the pretty country home to lend a hand in the search for William that day, many even travelling from other cities. Local news stations arrived at 48 Benaroon Drive, all to cover this remarkable story. They assumed that with a large amount of people out looking for William, that he would soon be found, and they would have their feel-good family story for the six o'clock news. But unfortunately, they would be wrong. Many continued the search long after the sun went down, some neighbours offering hot drinks and sandwiches to those who searched through the night. But William wouldn't be found that night or the next night and for eight years the people of Kendall have been asking one question. What happened? to William Tyrrell. We William Tyrrell didn't quite have the easiest start in life. He was born on the 26th of June 2011 into quite a troubled family and he and his two-year-old sister wouldn't stay with their biological parents for very long. At the age of nine months old, baby William would be removed from their care due to accusations of domestic violence in the home and also due to the fact that both parents were habitual drug users. Team this undesirable family history up with the fact that William's biological father had been arrested for theft and Child Protective Services decided that the children would be better placed within the foster care system. And at hearing this news, his parents made an awful mistake. They bundled baby William up into a car and prepared for a long journey. For almost nine weeks, they were on the run until finally the pass caught up to them. Both being being under the age of four, luckily William and his sister were prime candidates for adoption and they wanted them to stay together so pretty soon they were placed within an older couple's home in Sydney's Upper North Shore. Being a wealthy and successful family, this was any foster child's dream placement or so would seem. William and his sister were still allowed access for visitation with their biological parents, which is something that their foster parents weren't too happy about. After almost a year in his new family's custody, William began blossoming into a loving and happy little child. But like most three-year-olds, he could be a wee bit cheeky. He loved learning new things like how to swim and how to ride his bike, but above all else, he loved one thing, Spider-Man. Fun story time, and he'll probably kill me for saying this on YouTube, but my little cousin, don't worry, I won't name and shame you, was obsessed 
with Spider-Man to the point where he went to nursery and would not answer to any other name apart from Peter Parker. When William received his very own Spidey suit for his third birthday, it became his second skin. He would never want to take it off. But things weren't always rosy in the new household for the children. It had been said that before his disappearance, William had been acting out. He would often slap and bite his foster mum in sheer frustration. It was apparent that he got along a lot better with his foster father and he definitely gave his foster mum a hard time, something that she would blame on his visitations with his biological parents. She said that every time he would visit his biological parents, things would get increasingly worse in the home. So during this difficult time just before Friday the 12th of September in 2014, William's family decided that an impromptu trip to the country to visit his foster grandmother in Kendall was exactly what they needed to unwind. The family left for the long drive on Thursday the 11th of September and they were caught on CCTV at a McDonald's near Heather Cray, which was about an hour and a half away from the grandmother's house. After grabbing a quick Happy Meal, the family arrived at the foster grandmother's house at around 9pm that evening. They headed straight to bed with William going into the spare room with his foster father and his older sister going into a room with his foster mother. The kids were said to have woken up really early that morning at 5.50am because William had had a restless night's sleep. This one is for all my parents who have got their toddlers sleeping in their beds with them. I pray for you because my little nephew stayed with me a few weeks ago and it was like this tiny human doing Cirque du Soleil. One minute his leg was up, one minute his head was hanging off the bed. I never get a wink of sleep. How can such a small person take up that amount of room? I mean, put that on Unsolved Mysteries. After a late night of acrobatics, William needed a hearty breakfast to get his energy back up, which consisted of eggs, OJ and toast. After he was finished eating, he played with his big sister. The two were said to have squabbled over a toy, just normal sibling stuff. And then he decided that he wanted to put on his Spider-Man suit and play lion around the house. He was crawling from room to room, roaring at his family members, and sadly, the rest is history. On the morning of Saturday, the 13th of September, the day after William William went missing, it started to become clear that something wasn't quite right. Investigators wondered if William had wandered off at all or if he'd been taken. This investigation, which had begun with an aid of hope, was turning more sinister by the minute. Police brought in cadaver dogs to see if they could pick up the toddler scent, but they found nothing. I've seen a lot of speculation online about this one factor, with certain people questioning whether the story of William vanishing in the garden was true at all, but that can be explained. Remember all those helpful volunteers on the day he disappeared? Well, essentially, with all of them walking through the crime scene, dozens of them, they could have potentially masked any trace of William from the property. The New South Wales Police Department also faced backlash for the fact that they hadn't taken any notes of those coming and going on the day William went missing. The many searchers who arrived on foot or in their cars never had their license plates noted or even had their names taken down. Because of the sheer lack of physical evidence, lead investigators started knocking on doors, turning to the locals, hoping that in such an isolated area, someone had perhaps heard something or even seen the getaway car. According to local witnesses, there was two cars that couldn't be accounted for on the morning of William's disappearance. One neighbour had heard a car's engine turning over at around 10.30 a.m that day. They assumed it was a postman, but the postman later confirmed that he had been there at 9.30am, so who was this mystery car? 
The second witness said they had seen a dark grey or green vehicle entering the street and get lost. They made a U-turn and then headed right back out the other way, but they never saw anyone enter the car. But the most promising lead came from a shocking source, William's very own foster mother, three days after he disappeared. In her initial statement, she couldn't recall any odd vehicles being parked in the street that day, but now her story had changed. She claimed she saw a white Holden station wagon and a dark grey sedan parked near the house on that morning. She said they were parked bumper to bumper, which struck her as odd as the street was practically isolated and they could have parked anywhere. So the owner of both cars must have been familiar with one another. William's foster mum said that she saw both vehicles there at 7am and 9.30am when she was out in the garden. The police made an appeal for both owners to come forward, but they never did. And many neighbours say it's because those cars were never really there. No one else has been able to confirm her version of events, not her own mother or her partner, who was out of the house that morning for work and running some errands. He was gone between 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., right before William disappeared. Others are adamant that she was mistaken about these two cars. One neighbour who lived right nearby where the cars were supposedly parked said that he had been in his garden that day and had definitely not seen them there. One witness said he had saw a dark grey car racing away from Benaroon Drive. However, he said the driver was a woman and that he saw a young boy wearing a Spider-Man suit with his hands pressed against the window. The 73-year-old man claimed that the woman was driving erratically, but many do question his statement for two reasons. One, it took him three years to come forward with this information and two, he told people that he wasn't sure if he had dreamt about it or if it actually happened. So what would be investigators next move? Well, for the lead detective, it was time to eat some cake and say goodbye because he was retiring y'all. Enter the hardest and one of the most seasoned detectives in all of Australia, Detective Gary Jubelin, who joined the case in January 2015. Now, Gary's old school and sometimes downright aggressive tactics made him quite controversial, but if your child went missing, he's a kind of no-nonsense cop that you'd want on your case. And in typical Gary Jubelin fashion, he hit the ground running. Who would be his first person of interest? Local washing machine repairman Bill Spedding had visited 48 Benaroon Drive on the Wednesday before the family arrived. He'd spoken to William's foster grandmother about a broken washing machine, which she said she needed up and running for family visiting at the weekend. After having a little look at the machine, Bill determined that he needed some parts which would take a couple of days to come in. So, alas, he wouldn't be able to fix it that day, but he would visit a few days later. He'd been quite clear about the waiting times, so he was very shocked when he received an irritated and Karen-ish phone call on the Friday morning from none other than William's foster mother. She accused Bill of swindling her mother and leaving the elderly woman deliberately without a washing machine and demanded that he come to the home that morning and fix it immediately. Still confused by this weird altercation, Bill reiterated the fact that the part hadn't arrived yet and that he would contact the family as soon as it had. He was a little bit miffed about the whole situation but he chalked it up to just miscommunication. But William's foster mother told New South Wales Police a different story. She said no, she was expecting Bill Spedding on the morning her son mysteriously disappeared, but he had never turned up. And just like that, 
the witch hunt was on. Bill Spading was publicly named as a person of interest in the abduction of William Tyrrell. The home he shared with his wife and four grandchildren who were under their care was searched but nothing was found and despite his story never wavering, he was interviewed several times and accused of taking William from his grandmother's home. In such a small community as Kendall, word spread like wildfire and several locals were considering the fact that their local handyman was a child killer. And sadly, no one wants to hire a monster like that. And pretty soon, Bill Spading was going out of business and was worrying about losing his home. It wasn't just financial turmoil for the Spading family. They were receiving death threats through the mail and on their answering machines. And pretty soon, one by one, their own friends started turning on them. The drama surrounding Bill seemed to have reached its peak in the April of 2000. 2015 when he was charged of sex offences for something that had occurred back in 1987, almost 28 years before. When he was taken into police custody, he was strip searched and when he was nude, he had three men yelling at him, telling him if he didn't confess that they would insert inanimate objects into his rectum. But as we said, not one detail of Bill Spedding's story ever changed. He couldn't have abducted William that day because he had a solid alibi. Bill had actually attended his grandchild's school award ceremony and was seen by many staff members and other parents and guardians. After this, he went for lunch with his wife, which he paid for with his own credit card, and he still had a receipt to prove it. It appeared that the New South Wales Police Department had just been scrambling for something dark in Bill's past in order to get him into jail, and when the evidence wasn't there, he was acquitted on all charges. So he's a free man, happy days? Well, not really. This man's life was left in tatters due to the accusations against him. They lost their home and for quite some time, he and his wife feared that their grandchildren who were under their care would be taken from them and put into the foster system. With one big boo-boo under his belt, you think that Detective Gary Jublin would maybe tread a little more cautiously next time. But no, he had his next suspect in his eyeline, someone that several neighbours had been pointing the finger at. 70-year-old recent widower Paul Savage. Paul, William's foster grandmother's next door neighbour, had lived a quiet life with his wife for many years and had a squeaky clean criminal record. But all of this didn't stop Gary Jublin from focusing all of his energy solely on him. He thought it was strange that when all of the neighbours were rallying together to search for William, Paul Savage was adamant that he would go out searching on his own. Neighbours described Paul as a bit of an oddball. He would often be seen talking to himself and he wouldn't really socialise with others. Now, was this man just quite solitary and enjoyed his own company or did he have a killer instinct? Regardless, Gary Jublin was going to find out one way or another. On one occasion, Gary planted a fake child Spider-Man suit in the bushes outside Paul's home. He also planted a camera there so he could gauge the elderly man's reaction when he found what looked like evidence. At the time, many believed that Gary was trying to push the narrative that William had been snatched by the next door neighbour and that he was nothing but a creepy old man. However, this wasn't the first time that Detective Gary Jublin had tried to give the course of justice a gentle nudge. It was later revealed that he had bugged Paul Savage's residence and had also illegally recorded conversations between them. Because of his unorthodox methods, Gary Jublin was charged on four counts of breaching the Surveillance Devices Act. He was sentenced to pay a fine of $10,000 and he quickly resigned from the New South Wales Police Department. Gotta protect that pension though. Hmm? With Gary now off the case and a new team playing catch-up, a brand new suspect 
came to light. A 73 year old sex offender who at the time only lived 10 minutes away from William's foster grandmother's home at 48 Benaroon Drive. The man in question, Frank Abbott, certainly fit the profile. He was a white male over the age of 40 and he was known to law enforcement. He'd previously been accused of the sexual abuse of four children, two girls and two boys. He was sentenced to three of those and served jail time shortly after William's disappearance. Several witnesses connected Frank directly to the crime, first being his long time friend and fishing buddy Ray Porter. Ray, who had been in a nursing home receiving end of life care for kidney failure, had told a nurse a shocking secret. He leaned his head over on the nurse's shoulder and sighed and said, I didn't do anything wrong. I just gave my mate and that boy a lift. When she asked which boy he was talking about, he said, you know, the one missing from Kendall. She asked him if he was talking about William Tyrrell, to which he said yes, but there are a few holes in his story. He never named Frank directly. The nurse just assumed he was talking about Frank because he only ever had two friends that would come to visit him. Also, Ray had an appointment for dialysis on the day William went missing from 9am till 3pm, so he would have had no opportunity to pick Frank Abbott up at 10.30am in Kendall. These kind of inconsistencies do make you wonder wonder was there any truth to this? Well, Frank Abbott's very own neighbours think there was. They said the day after William went missing, as searchers were seen on the news looking for the toddler, he laughed and said they're looking in the wrong place. They'll never find him there. No one can deny that Frank Abbott is a monster, but was he more than just a dirty old man? Maybe. In his youth, he was a lead suspect in the rape and murder of three young women. 17-year-old Helen Harrison, 37-year-old Margaret Cox and 22-year-old Susan Eisenhood. The day after Margaret Cox went missing, Frank Abbott was seen around town with deep gouges on his forearms and the back of his hands. When his friends questioned him on this, he said that he'd been scratched whilst picking up oysters. But no, they were sure they were made by human fingernails. He was actually tried twice for the murder of young shop worker Helen Harrison, but never convicted. All three crimes still remain unsolved to this day. Possibly one of his most disturbing crimes was when a neighbour of his caught him sexually assaulting her dog in the back of his camper van. Is Frank Abbott a rotting ham sandwich of a human being? Yes. Did he abduct William Tyrrell? Well, despite a lot of people pointing their fingers at him, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Eventually, back in 2020 and 2021, law enforcement did extensively look into Frank Abbott. They searched a sawmill which he was staying at at the time of William's disappearance, but they found nothing. So, if not Frank Abbott, then who? Some in New South Wales Police Department believe that the reason this case has remained unsolved for so long wasn't because of something that Gary Jubilin did, but because of something he didn't do. It was no secret that during this investigation, Detective Gary Jubilin became increasingly close to William's foster parents. Maybe a little bit too close, as he never formally considered them as suspects. However, in 2021, everything changed because it came to light that not only had William's foster parents lied to law enforcement about crucial details in the case, but they were also being charged with dark allegations of child abuse. 
these claims, which are believed to have come from William's older sister, have shed a dark and sinister light on this eight-year-old cold case. 60% of child abuse cases are reported by those within the foster care system, with 30% of them being of a sexual nature. You'd never want to assume that someone who has been literally designated to look after a child within the foster care system would hurt that child, but unfortunately, this wouldn't be the first time and it won't be the last. In April of this year, 2022, 38-year-old Laura Castle, who alongside her husband, Scott Castle, was taking care of a one-year-old little boy, Leyland James Corkhill, was charged with murdering the very same little baby she had promised to protect. Whilst actually in the process of adopting little Leyland, this evil excuse for a human and her equally despicable husband shared horrifying texts regarding their foster child. In these texts, Scott Castle said that the child was a knobhead and a fat shit and Laura boasted having leathered him because he was too whingy. For those out there that don't know what leathered means, it means she physically battered the child. This wee angel finally succumbed to Laura's beatings when he died of severe head injuries in January 2021. Even though Vile Laura was sentenced in April 2022 to serve a minimum of 18 years behind bars, this case left the public with more questions than answers. According to close family and friends, she was exhibiting red flags from the moment they brought the young boy home. She couldn't stand to be around the baby, she would often ask others to watch him and she had minimal interaction with him from the point that he arrived in the house to the point that he left in a body bag. Many said she wasn't ashamed of saying the most disgusting things about him and that she should have never been a mother. So how was this missed? Small children are most at risk within the foster care system when they physically can't speak for themselves. It's been obvious for decades that this is an extremely flawed system, but what I'm asking is, was William Tyrrell another child who was failed by Child Protective Services? Since the first time I saw that infamous photo of William popping up on my TV screen, I never believed that he left 48 Benaroon Drive alive. There's no concrete evidence of an abduction. There's just these second-hand whispers about creepy old men living nearby. Evidence would later show in 2021 that the last known photo of William had its timestamp deliberately altered. A screenshot was taken of the original photo, which was captured at 7.39, and then the original was deleted to make it look like that picture had been taken at 9.37. This was considered crucial evidence at the beginning of the investigation, as this was William's last proof of life photo, and it was all a lie. When I see that picture of William, frozen in time, giving out the biggest roar. I can't help but think of my own little nephew who has the same big brown eyes and who was roaring like a lion before he could even speak. If William had had the life he deserved, he would have been heading off to high school with his friends this August. Would he have liked football? Would he have been into his academics? Maybe he would have found an interest within Marvel comic books. We may never get the answer to these questions unless we can finally bring William home. So on the 26th of June this month, William's birthday, tell someone about him, share his story, and let everyone know that we will never forget the name William Tyrrell, the boy with the bravest roar in all of Australia.
If you like this week's episode, please give it a big thumbs up for me. It really helps my channel. All of the relevant details, if you've got any information regarding this case, will be listed in the comments box below. If you're watching for the first time and the crazy lady bun and the strange sticky out ear hasn't put you off, then please hit that subscribe button. If you would like to follow me, not home because it's illegal, on Instagram, at Megan True Crime. I also have a TikTok page at megan.truecrime. I'm also 97 and I'm on Twitter at megantruecrime. I love you all so so much so don't forget to lock your doors, don't talk to strangers and also please remember the name William Tyrrell and share his story. See ya! Oh look, I'm drinking Coke Zero because it's got no calories. Whoever said nothing ever tastes as good as being skinny feels clearly never had pizza. Bye.